on the 21st of October 1962. The Norwegian coastal steamer Sankt Svitun was preparing to set sail from Trondheim and northwards to Rødvik, a journey of about nine hours. The weather at the time was like it's normally in Norway during autumn. But this day would be her last day. There was nothing to worry about. Sankt Svitun was a modern ship for her time and she had been doing these runs between Bergen and Kirkenes for 12 years. Just like Sankt Svitun in 1962, the northbound coastal steamer Kong Haral behind me is also preparing to do the exactly same journey. In this video, made available 62 years after the events on that October night in 1962. We will try to explore the tragic circumstances that occurred on the coast of Norway. There is so much more to this story, so many more details and events than what we are able to cover in a short video. We have tried to keep a chronological order of the events that night. The St. Svitun disaster would have a tremendous impact on many coastal communities along the Norwegian coast and especially at the small village of Rødvik where the ship was headed and also where the rescue operations were originated from. Many people would not make it through the night and many would therefore not be reunited with their families again. All the companies in Hurtigruten had experienced great losses to their fleets during the war years from 1940 to 1945. Stavangerske had also lost their former Sankt Svitun at Stad after an air raid bombing in September 1943, after which Kong Håkon from 1904 entered service as a relief ship. The old Kong Håkon from 1904 was an old ship and she needed to be replaced with a new ship. The new ship was ordered as the last ship of four identical Italian-built post-war ships and would be given the name Sankt Svitun and sail under the house flag of Stavangerske Dampship Selskap, a steamship company located in Stavanger. These four ships were commonly known as the stockfish ships because a part of the building cost was paid with stockfish. This company had only one ship participating in Hurtigruten and the brand new Sankt Svitun would replace their older vessel Kong Håkon from 1904. Kong Håkon would therefore be replaced by a Sankt Svitun for the second time in her history. Prior to Sankt Svitun, three Italian-built ships had already been delivered from Cantieri di Uniti dell'Adriatico in Ancona, Italy. Erling Jarl, Midnazur and Westerålen. On May 18, 1950, a day after Norway celebrated their Constitution Day, the ship was launched at the Italian shipyard. She was practically completed at her launch, and she set sail for her sea trails only two hours after first meeting with the sea. She was accepted and delivered to Stavangerske Dampship Selskap a short week later on May 25, 1950. The voyage home to Norway started not long after, with Captain Samuel Alsager in command. He had been a captain with the company since 1928 and personified the company and their ships in the coastal route known as Hurtigruten. He had previously been the captain of their former steamship Sankt Svitun, as well as their steamship Kong Håko. The voyage home to Norway stopped by both Palermo and Algiers and went without any problem. She even managed to achieve a cruising speed of 15.5 knots on her voyage home. Sankt Svitun arrived in her home port of Stavanger on June 4, 1950 and was well received by many in various celebrations. She quickly became the pride of not only the company, but also her home port. On June 8, 1950, at 2200 hours, she was, as the newest and most modern Hurtigruta, ready to start operating in the Norwegian Coastal Express between Bergen and Sitkenes, known locally as Hurtigruten. 
Hutiruton had been operating as a shared service between several shipping companies since 1893. During the later decades, the service operated as a round-trip service from Bergen in the south to Kirkenes in the north, carrying local passengers, mail, cargo, stockfish, fresh fish, and other vital supplies. After the end of World War II, these ships were an important part in the rebuilding of northern Norway, utterly devastated by years of war. The ship was 2,095 gross register ton as delivered, and after a conversion in 1961, she measured 2,172 gross register tons. Sankt Sviten had a length of 268 feet or just about 82 meters. She was identical to her three sister ships and had two classes, first class forward and second class aft. She had 77 berths at first class and 108 in second class. New at the time, all cabins had both warm and cold water. Maximum passenger carrying capacity was 600, 575 or 450 depending on which areas she sailed. Her engine was an 8-cylinder Fiat engine with 2,500 shaft horsepower, about 1,838 kilowatt at the shaft and able to give the ship a maximum speed of 15.5 knots. Sankt Svitun was delivered with the latest in navigational equipment. Two radars, one radio direction finder, one gyro compass, with three repeaters, as well as a magnetic compass and an echo sounder. She was equipped with six lifeboats seating 190 persons and one life raft for 12 people. There was also other floating devices for another 133 persons and 575 life belts. In 1956, six years after her delivery, Captain Alsager signed off the Sankt Svitun for the last time and the ship was handed over to the command of Captain Johannes A. Klebeland. The ship did have some mishaps during her early years of operation. In January of 1952, she had a minor grounding at a sandbank at Irisøyrenna, but quickly slid off the sand and continued on her sailing. They did, however, experience some problems with the engine shortly afterwards, and the ship had to be sent to the shipyard at Bergen for repairs. On May 1, 1952, the Sankt Svitun grounded again, this time at Rørskjærsnage, just outside of the pier at Brønnesund. Once again, she made it off by herself and continued on her northward journey to Sannesjøen, where divers inspected the vessel. She would cancel her remaining sailing and return to Bergen again for repairs. Her passengers were transferred over to her sister ship, the Midnight Sol. During a routine visit to the shipyard in February 1961, the ship's second class aft was modified in accordance with findings after a serious fire on board the sister ship Erling Jarl in Bode in January of 1958. The second class smoking launch was spilled out all the way out towards the ship sides and both sides. Sixty-two years after it happened, we all know that Sankt Svitun would in 1962 forever be linked to the worst maritime tragedy in Norwegian coastal waters in peacetime. Captain was Johannes A. Kleveland and maritime inspector Hilmar Dahle of Stavangerske, the company, was on board as passenger as well. Curiously, this was to be Kleveland's final journey as captain, as his retirement was a short week away when the ship would return to Bergen. Because of this, the ship's planned new captain, Captain Oddleif Anker Pedersen, was also on board. He was expected to take full command of Sankt Svitun when they returned to Bergen again. Behind me is Brattøra in Trondheim. And even though the buildings have dramatically changed, this is still the place where Sankt Svitun 62 years ago departed for the very last time. On October 21st, 1962, the northbound coastal steamer Sankt Svitun departed from Trondheim an hour behind schedule at 1 o'clock in the afternoon with 89 souls on board. The voyage to Rødvik would take 9 hours and during this voyage, they expected to catch up with some of the delay.
The ship followed its usual courses out Trondheimsfjorden, rounded northwards between Garten and Storfosna, passed both Stocksund and Besaker off on starboard side, and continued north. She then followed her usual track up to Buhornsrosa lighthouse at the southern end of an open sea stretch called Folla. All was well on board at the time, the weather was southwest strong gale with rain showers. After passing Folla, she would have arrived at the small fishing community called Rødby. At 19.55, St. Svitun passed Buhornrosa lighthouse on her starboard side, and at the same time there was a change of watch in the wheelhouse. Captain Cleveland, first mate Tor Rasmussen, and pilot Tysnes, relieved chief mate Jørn Wik, second mate Eriksen, and pilot Paul Wikre at Five minutes later, at 2000 hours, it was the helmsman's watch change. Helmsman Carlsen was scheduled to man the helm for the next hour. When he took over the helm, he was informed that the ship was saving a course of 342 degrees. The captain had been having dinner in the officer's mess with maritime inspector Hilmar Dahle and the new captain, Captain Anker Pedersen. Captain Cleveland arrived at the bridge 30 minutes later at about 20 30. The weather at the time was now west-southwest gale forced winds with strong rain showers and poor visibility and some swell. For the Norwegian coast at autumn, this would have been a fairly normal day weather-wise. When Captain Cleveland arrived at the bridge around 8.30, pilot Tisnes informed the captain that he had set the course 7 degrees further west due to the weather, and the captain acknowledged this while he listened to the pilot being concerned about the low visibility of about 4 to 5 nautical miles. The captain turned on the big radar and the minutes continued to tick by. A short while later, the helmsman was ordered by the pilot to go back and steer the course 335 degrees before a new course change again at about 8.45 to 333 degrees, this due to an oncoming ship. This course was kept for about 5 minutes before they returned to steer the course of 335 degrees. Also at about this time, a course change from 350 degrees to 35 degrees should have been done, but pilot Tuesday for some reason postponed that course change. Helmsman Carlsen was relieved at the helm at 2100 hours and he told his reliever to continue steering 335 degrees as pilot had requested. The new helmsman repeated the course to ensure that he heard it correctly, but before Carlsen left the bridge, the pilot asked if they were steering 35 degrees, to which Carlsen replied yes. And this is something that would become important for the outcome of that night. The emittance of the first digit was something that was done from time to time. So he was confident that 35 degrees still referred to 335 degrees. The last course he had been given and that they were still maintaining. The radio officer at the Rødvik coastal station had some messages to relay to the ship and tried hailing the ship at the maritime emergency frequency just after 9 o'clock, but got no reply. The radio officer then called the ship's agent and was told that the ship is expected to arrive at Rødvik at 9.45. At 21.12, 12 minutes past 9, the machine telegraph was set to slow speed. It is believed that the watchman on the bridge had now spotted Norøyan lighthouse, which they mistakenly assumed was Grinna lighthouse. These two lighthouses had similar characteristics and they expected to see Grinna lighthouse at this time. Hence, their confidence they were up by Grinna. It is assumed that since they saw Norøyan lighthouse, which they mistook for Grinna lighthouse, and since the change of watch for the helmsman was at 9, the wrong course had only been kept since the change of watch, in example, for 12 minutes. The previous helmsman was not called up to the wheelhouse to state what course he had been steering up until 2100 hours. The ship's position in relation to the lighthouse was incorrect, so the compass course was likely checked by the officers who then probably found out that the ship was on a wrong course. The ship's course was now changed again, but with the wrong position, this course would take the ship straight up into the shallows at Uxen by Nordejan lighthouse. At some point, they also increased the ship's speed again. Looking in the famous rear view mirror, with information we now have, the bridge team clearly suffered from something we today call confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency to search for 
interpret, favor, and recall information in a way that confirms and supports one's prior beliefs or values. People display this bias when they select information that supports their views, ignoring contrary information or when they interpret ambiguous evidence as supporting their existing attitudes. On board the St. Svitun at 21.56 hours, ship inspector Hilmar Dahle was sitting in a smoking salon and heard a ship running aground hard. He immediately ran to the bridge. They had indeed ran aground, and he saw the captain being utterly confused about the light from a lighthouse that he saw. The light was steady and not intermittent as he expected it to be. The captain did, however, seem very confident that the ship had run aground and that the lighthouse he saw was Grinna Lighthouse. Unbeknownst or known to the officers on the bridge at the time, the ship had run aground hard, ripping open its cargo hull and the keel beneath the engine room. At 21.58 hours, Sang Svitun sends out their first mayday call on the distress radio channel. The coastal station at Rødvik immediately picks up, but the ship is not able to hear the radio station. St. Svitun is heard calling Mayday several times. After switching channel frequency a couple of times, contact is established at emergency frequency 2182 kHz. Time was noted as 22.02 hours. In the emergency message, St. Svitun stated they had ran aground at Bumdefallene, a set of low rock islets just south of Grinna Lighthouse. They required immediate assistance. Rødvik Coastal Radio acknowledged the message and asked St. Svitun to be standby at this frequency while help is being organized. Southbound coastal steamer Rangvaljal had been delayed and was still docked at Rødvik doing cargo operations, and Rødvik Coastal Radio establishes contact with Captain Fjell at Rangvaljal. The southbound coastal steamer departed Rødvik and set full speed to quickly find St. Svitun and to render whatever assistance they could. The cargo ship Usha was heading north, a short distance from Grinna Lighthouse, reported that they had picked up the distress call from St. Svitun as well and had already turned to go to the rescue. After the alarm being raised, several ships in the area now started preparing to sail and started heading towards the last known location of St. Svitun, just south of Grinna Lighthouse. At 22.20 hours, Usha reported that they were in the actual area but saw nothing. They established contact with St. Svitun and asked them to send up some emergency rocket, to which they agreed. At 22.36 hours, St. Svitun reports that they had fired some emergency rockets, but Usha, in the vicinity of Grinna Lighthouse, replied that they had never seen any. At 22.50 hours, St. Svitun reports that they have fired off their last emergency rocket. More and more ships were now being organized by Rødvik Radio to render assistance to the stricken ship, and at 22.57 hours, St. Svitun reported to having launched three of their lifeboats and that they were equipped with emergency lights. Around this time, both Usha, together with the southbound coastal steamer Rangvaljal, were at location by Grinna Lighthouse, but none of them were able to see the vessel in distress. Rangvaljal was asked by Rødvik Radio to coordinate the fishing vessels arriving in the area and to assist in the search. Fear and frustration now most likely spread among the ships participating in the search. They were at a given distress location, but could not see anything. No one knew where St. Svitun could be. At 23.04 hours, St. Svitun reported that they had lost all power and that the radio batteries were almost drained. On board St. Svitun, the passengers had been told that there was help en route from Rødvik and the captain ordered people into lifeboats. Many wondered at this and refused. Thus, there were no more than 10 men in the lifeboat, with the exception of one where there was still more than 20 people. During the launching of one of the lifeboats, another accident happened. The hoist got stuck and the boat capsized so that everyone in it ended up in the sea, while the lifeboat was left hanging by one cable and was blown to pieces by the wind against the ship. None of the people in this boat were saved. The other boats got on the water without difficulty. 
At around 23.05 hours, the ship settled vertically, but there were still people on board, passengers who had put their trust in the rescue vessels to arrive and crew who had searched the ship to get all the passengers out of their cabins. These had to wait until the ship sank to use the rafts. It would later be assumed that the ship had foundered not too many minutes after. Four or five people disappeared in the sea as the ship went down. Many vessels were now searching the area reported as Sangsvitun's distress position, but there was nothing to see. This is a treacherous area, dotted with more than 6,000 small islets and very dangerous scaries. The weather, reduced visibility and darkness was no help either. As the time quickly passed and midnight approached, the area between Grinna and Sörjärslingan had been completely searched by the 15 vessels and nothing had been found. There was no more communication from the Sangsvitun. At Nureyan Lighthouse, a lighthouse further out to sea, the lighthouse staff were unaware of the drama that were taking place in the sea south of the lighthouse. When the lighthouse keeper was out on an errand, he noticed diesel fumes coming in from the sea. No one had notified the lighthouse that the ship had been in trouble, so this was an unexpected registration in the dark. When he got back in, he turned on the radio and learned that Sangsvitun had sunk near Grinna lighthouse. He and his wife sat down and listened to the fisheries frequency on the radio wave. Around 1.30 hours, the lighthouse keeper at Nureyan heard a stone smash against the window. He went out and he saw there was crew from St. Svitun standing outside. They were a total of 10 to 15 survivors outside. The lighthouse keeper reported this by calling Rødvik Radio. The survivors stated they had drifted with the weather and this information was also transmitted onwards to Rangvaljal. Only then did it occur to the rescue coordination team that the ship's crew must have mistaken the lighthouse beacons. At 0 to 10 hours, cargo vessel Usha reported that they were making their way towards Nureyan Lighthouse, together with the other rescue vessels. An aircraft had been requisitioned, but would not be in the air before 5 in the morning. At 02.27, Rang Valial reported that they would return to Rörvik to pick up more nautical charts for the new search area. Local boats were organized to go and pick up the survivors at Nureyan Lighthouse while Usha stood by with the bow heading into the seas and the wind, waiting in the area for dawn to arrive. They all hoped and prayed to see Sangsvitun as soon as daylight broke. Darkness and reduced visibility was making the search really difficult in those very dangerous waters. Only local fishing boats that knew these waters were able to continue to search between deafening breaking seas. At 03.50 in the morning, Nureyan Lighthouse reported to Rødvik Radio that the coastline had been searched with lights and that nothing had been found. At 04.35, after Rangvald Jarl had returned to Rødvik, Captain Fjell showed up at Rødvik Radio to discuss with the rescue coordinators. At 05.40, Rødvik Radio got notified that an Albatross aircraft would arrive in the area around 8.30 in the morning. At 06.10, Rødvik Radio received a report that two lifeboats had been spotted in the area with a total of nine persons on board. At 06.55, Rang Valjal reports that they are back in the area and were continuing their search. Another lifeboat with no people was then spotted by one of the rescue ships. At 0.45, near Korsholmsfalle. At 07.58, another of the search vessels reported to have found 10 survivors and 8 dead. As dawn arose, more and more survivors and dead were being reported as found. The ship, Sankt Svitun, was nowhere to be seen. At 3 minutes past 9 in the morning, Rang Valjal reported that the area was far too dangerous for such a large vessel and at 9.25 it was decided that they would continue their voyage southwards to Trondheim. The only vessels suitable between these islets and skerries were local, smaller vessels. At that time, most of the larger vessels were being dismissed. By now, they all most likely realized that St. Svitun had indeed foundered, and it is still to this day extremely hard to imagine the thoughts and feelings of loss and helplessness 
felt by those on board the Rangvaljal as she made her way south to Trondheim. At 5 minutes past 11 in the morning, local vessel Vikna reported that they were returning to Rødvik with a total of 41 survivors. They were also asked to pick up another 7 survivors at another location before making their way back. At this time, both helicopters and aircrafts were in on the search as well. From that point onwards, only wreckage and debris were found. As they were also trying to establish how many people were actually on board the St. Svitun when she departed from Trondheim. At 18 minutes past 4 in the afternoon, the emergency traffic by telegraph was halted and at 10 minutes to 9 the following evening, all emergency traffic by telephone was halted. The search for further survivors would continue with daylight the following day. On October 23, 1962, the wreck was located by a rescue vessel after observing oil reaching the surface of the water about 200 meters east-northeast of an islet called Uxen near Norøyan Lighthouse. The wreck was expected to rest at a depth of 66 meters. In the following days, all pieces of wreckage as well as deceased were being searched for, recovered and taken to Rødvik. By this time, it was believed that the ship had sailed from Trondheim with a total of 89 persons on board, 40 passengers and 47 crew and 2 post officers. 48 had been found alive while 41 had perished through the night and as the ship went down. Survivors stated that there had been no panic on board, but the struggles to get off the ship in the dark night with poor weather was something only those who survived would fully understand. That is a different story for another time. A memorial service at the Rødvik Chapel was held on October 23, 1962, served by the parish priest of Vikna, Hilmar Rumsøy. Something no one thought possible in modern times had happened. A ship full of modern navigational aids had misnavigated and foundered some 18 nautical miles off course. The accident investigation was done at Rødvik in the following days after the tragedy. With the witness testimony of the helmsman, it was quickly determined that the ship went off course at some point because the course change from 335 to 035 degrees had never taken place after passing Guhorns Rosa lighthouse. Apart from the helmsman, between 8 and 9 in the evening, all the ship's officers on the bridge perished that night. The biggest question many had is why had the course steered? not been questioned. The cause of the St. Svitun tragedy will never be fully clarified as everyone on the last watch, captain, pilot, first mate and helmsman all perished. As a result, no one knows for sure what happened in the wheelhouse during this time. So this is based on assumptions during investigation. The worst example of confirmation bias had clearly taken place that night with a most tragic outcome. In conclusion, the cause of the accident was determined to be a misunderstanding between pilot and helmsman. At that time, it was common to omit the first digit when saying the courses. So when the ship went to 350 degrees and pilot gave orders for 42 degrees and later 35 degrees. This must have been a misunderstanding by the helmsman. 342 degrees and 335 degrees. Lack of control of the compass on the part of the officers were probably also a triggering factor. The ship should have changed course from 350 to 35 degrees to sail north towards Nærøysunne and Rødvik, but that never happened, which again led to one of the biggest shipping tragedies in Norway in peacetime. Almost 24 years would pass before anyone laid their eyes upon the ship again. On May 8, 1986, divers from a local diving club in Trøndelag County located and dived down to the ship at its resting place 64 meters beneath the sea. 
The ship rests at its starboard side and gave signs of tremendous forces having torn the ship apart. The bow was separated from the rest of the ship. Anchors had been dropped and had run all the way out. The starboard side of the stern was smashed against the rocks and part of the superstructure had also been torn off. Today, 62 years after the ship sank, the wreck is not much more than a big heap of unrecognizable steel pipes and cables at the seafloor. The propeller is still very much recognizable, and because of what it is made of, the propeller will probably be the last identifiable part of St. Sveten for a very good while more into the future. On August 3rd, 2002, a memorial was finally unveiled at Nordeyan, not far from the lighthouse, in memory of those who perished during this tragedy. The name, age, and place of residence of all those who died are listed on the memorial stone. The sea does not distinguish between those who drown in it and those who sail on its surface. What is lost at sea is never truly lost, for the memories and love remain anchored in our hearts. Thank you very much for learning about this tragic day in Norwegian maritime history. There is so much more to this story than what I have been able to include in this video. There are countless events and details not included. No matter what, thank you so much for watching and if you would like to see more like this, you will need to help me promote my channel by liking the video, commenting on the video, subscribing to the channel and sharing this video with others that might find it interesting.